Now, new digital health tools, I think, will really help many. And it's an amazing how fast innovations are growing. But what about the real interaction? What about the human touch and maybe the meeting of eyes uh, as a contrast or maybe as a complement to the digital tools? We're now going to hear about the human-animal interaction as a way of treatment. Welcome, Dr. Andrea Beetz, professor at the International University of Applied Science in Germany. Hi, Hello, Andrea. Welcome. Welcome. So, let me just start my presentation. Can you all see it? I can see it. Very good. Wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me to such a highly interesting and needed session for all the new methodologies that you can apply in psychotherapy. The, the possibilities of the internet are really fascinating and a thank you to my previous uh, speakers. Um, I've used internet now myself as a therapist in, in psychotherapy to keep in touch with my clients, but usually I do face to face and I've learned a lot today. But what I am going to talk about today is something that really is not compatible with uh, the internet or internet-based um, therapy. Because I'm talking about the benefits of the human-animal interaction for mental health and well-being and how you can integrate animals into psychotherapy. So something that's called animal-assisted interventions. Um, we know from different studies, actually now there's a good base, uh, evidence base for that, that pet ownership has some health effects on humans. For instance, um, in big um, surveys, um, pet owners do have, uh, do report less doctor visits, take less medication for sleep problems, for instance, exercise more, they have better subjective fitness. And also, if you look at the survival rate after one year of their heart infarction, at least the dog owners um, do much or significantly better than the not, not pet or not dog owners. Um, another short introduction to what are we talking about in terms of what is an animal-assisted intervention. We distinguish between animal-assisted activities. You might have heard about people taking the dogs and visiting nursing homes um, just for giving a possibility to pet the dogs um, and to bring some joy and, and topic for conversation. Then we have another form that is really animal assisted therapy and here a human therapist trained in his profession needs to deliver the therapy and he or she integrates the animal into their usual approaches. And another field is animal assisted education where you have animals integrated um, into the school lectures or um, in the afternoon school activities also here to prevent mental health problems or just to promote learning experiences. And to give you an impression what how this could look like, I'll give you an example um, from our work and also research. Um, I worked in a project together with the German Bundeswehr um, to develop a dog assisted intervention as an adjunct therapy to psychotherapy for soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder. And we had um, German soldiers and each of them participated um, in a three hour session every morning, uh, not every morning, once a week for four weeks. They've usually been um, in uh, in-house treatment for six weeks in one of the Bundeswehr Krankenhäusern. And what, it looked like was that there was a dog with his handler and all these teams have been tested for you know, friendliness and non-aggression and everything. And here the special thing was that it was delivered actually by other soldiers working with their um, military dog. Um, and each patient got assigned a team and they just went for a walk, they groomed the dog, they made little games with the dog, nothing aggressive. And also the handlers were instructed not to talk about the trauma, not to talk about the war experiences, just to give them an opportunity to enjoy being with the dog, being outside um, and enjoy the contact. 
And this was, of course, in addition to the standard psychotherapeutic treatment that they received. Um, but these sessions were uh, talked about in group therapy sessions that followed on the next day. What we found, and this is also has been published, you will see the reference in the last slide, um, that what was very important is that there was a good relationship developing between the dog, um, uh, between the patient and the dog and the handler. Uh, the soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder, there's a lot of distrust towards other people. There's a lot of anxiety and stress. Um, being outside often is very challenging and especially the surrounding where they had the therapy delivered. There was um, um, a military base nearby and the jets sometimes flew over this um, area. And what they reported, even besides all the data that we collected, was really important uh, from the view of a therapist. It was first that they actually had the experience of being able to trust someone again. And this translated also to other humans. Um, also that they were able to relax being around someone else, being around the dog and that they had fun. Many of them said it was the first time I was able to laugh again. Um, because in psychotherapy, we all know what bad experiences our clients have made. Um, sometimes it's difficult to find something to joke about. It seems inappropriate. But if the dog does something funny, you never think it's inappropriate and you feel free to laugh and, and to make jokes about it. And maybe here's one um, sentence that you can see that one of our patients uh, said, um, it was the first time in years that I could not only tolerate, but enjoy the physical contact with another being and relax. Even the jets did not trigger anything. I just focused on Gina, that was the name of the dog. And this physical contact really is something that is so normal and usual in animal assisted interventions, but it's very special in psychotherapy where you usually when you learn or train how to be a psychotherapist, you are told, do not touch your patients. But we know about the mechanisms that happen and, and how this can enhance building trust with the animal, because um, with the animal, the touch is not regulated by any kind of societal expectations. But with other humans, if you would just uh, you know, touch your PTSD patients, that would probably even increase their stress and, and not be helpful. So let me proceed to some other information about animal assisted psychotherapy. You will find many different species in this area. Very common is the employment of dogs and horses in therapeutic riding. But we also have therapists that work with farm animal species like chicken, sheep, goats, donkeys, pigs, cows. So they usually have a little farm and they deliver the psychotherapy in the surrounding. Also llamas and alpacas have, been, uh, have become very popular. Um, they're very sensitive in, in the interactions. And you can also find small animals like guinea pigs or rabbits. It's usually more for feeding um, than for petting. And there are different approaches. For instance, it can be uh, a form of adjunct therapy where there's a standard treatment and you just have the possibility for certain experiences like relaxation, touch, cuddling, um, of being accepted, of, you know, it doesn't feel like therapy, but it's still very good for the mental well being of the patient. And sometimes it sets the stage for the actual treatment, like reducing stress before a trauma therapy or providing social support by having the dog there. Um, and then the other approach is actually having the animal present during the psychotherapy. Many psychotherapists now um, work with animals. And so the dog is present the whole session, for instance. And while you're talking about stressful events, um, you can pet the dog and this usually reduces your stress and makes you feel more safe. What are the effects that have been documented by research, um, by experimental studies, randomized control trials, for persons um, who have no mental health problems, but also for persons with mental health problems, children, adults, and elderly. On a physiological level, we have documented in many studies that there is a reduction of stress, heart rate drops, blood pressure drops, cortisol levels drop, and this is mainly due to the activation of the oxytocin system via touch. 
Oxytocin is a hormone that regulates the whole system for calmness, connectedness, and it also counteracts stress reactions. Then we have psychological effects. It reduces depression and anxiety and promotes a positive mood, relaxation, concentration, and attention. All things that you would like to see in a psychotherapeutic setting. And it promotes in a social area, the communication, social interaction, and trust. And it reduces aggression. And all of this can happen um, if you integrate an animal into the therapy or it makes it easier for the therapist to reach these goals. You know, also human therapists, of course, can work towards reducing stress, building trust. But our experience is that if you integrate an animal, this is established quicker and often easier. What are the mechanisms underlying these effects? Um, for once, biophilia. Humans have always lived during the evolution together with animals in natural surroundings. And so it was um, had a survival effect for us. Um, the biological fitness was better if you paid attention to animals. They could be a source of food, but they also could be a source of danger or they could warn you about dangers. So if an animal is in your presence and this is a friendly, non-threatening animal that is calm and relaxed, this is obviously an unconscious cue for the patient that it's a safe surrounding and that he or she can relax. On the other hand, we are interested in animals due to the biophilia. So this is also motivating clients to attend therapy. For the soldiers, for instance, we had some um, patients who were really, we call it in Germany, therapie müde. They are tired of yet another therapy. And with the dogs, all people were quite happy to go on the bus to be brought to the dog school of the military um, there. And they participated, participated very freely and um, openly. So we see a lot of motivation build up. And it can lead to an optimal activation of the patient. If he's too stressed, the animals calm them down. If they are too tired and not motivated, they are activated. And as I said before, touch and via the touch, the activation of the oxytocin system might be a key variable here because um, there are five to six studies that show that petting a dog even for two to three minutes only um, gives peaks in oxytocin release in the, in the brain. Also, patients tend to develop something called openness to securely relate to others, to the therapist mainly, to build a therapeutic relationship. And animals also provide support, you know, especially when you've built trust and attachment to them, and they give you a possibility for caregiving to feel needed to be able to provide something for another being while before you always felt you're full of deficits, you cannot do anything for anyone. So, and this is a good opportunity to let patients take care of animals and feel important and needed. Due to the pandemic, we have some new research areas, also in animal assisted interventions. For once, the role of pets during the pandemic and how this positively affected a mental health if you owned an animal, and many people acquired an animal during that time. But also for the implementation of animal assisted therapies, of course, it became much more complicated due to hygiene issues to deliver animal assisted interventions. There are some of the references, there are much more. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via the email address. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. Um, can I ask you, what kind of reactions do you get from, from different countries? Uh, how mature are the different countries for this method? Well, it's, for instance, certain approaches like school dogs or also integrating animals in psychotherapy are more common in, in Germany, Austria, Switzerland and the Netherlands. But I have the feeling in the Scandinavian countries, it's just starting. They're, it's more difficult to implement this. But also in the, the United States, it's very popular by now to integrate animals in different um, therapeutic and educational approaches. Mm. Um, I, I have a question also from the uh, from the audience. Uh, what criteria sets the choice of an animal for psychotherapy? Oh, that's that's a good question because uh, there are so many different species, and it often 
it depends on what kind of setting you have. If you're a psychotherapist and you have a dog and this dog is suitable and you train it, usually people say, oh, the dog is my animal of choice. If you are someone who is a, it, it depends really on the therapist, what kind of um, animal do you prefer? Because you have to be able to connect with the animal and work very, very fine tuned with the animal. Um, and then also it often depends more on the individual and on the personality of the animal than on what kind of species it is. Um, there are some people who relate nicely to cats. On the other hand, cats are difficult because many people are allergic to them if you use them in a, in a standard psychotherapeutic setting. So this is really a match between therapist and the choice of his animal or animals that he has and then choosing what is best for the patient. And certainly there are some um, things that, for instance, you can only achieve, for instance, with a horse. If it's about, you know, body posture, like more physiotherapy, then um, the horse is the animal of the choice because you can sit on the animal and it Im imitates the, germ, uh, the human gait uh, when it's moving. And there's no other animal where you can do the physiotherapy on the horse like that, or being carried by someone, you know, being, um, if, if this is the feeling where you're supposed to feel your body and um, really relate to that, for instance, if you have an eating disorder um, and to feel yourself again after a trauma, also there the horse has some advantages advantages because it's so big and, and you have so much physical contact with it mm. um, by riding. Mm. Thank you. Um, I, I've read about the robot animals working with mental well-being for um, seniors, it sense, in their homes, for example. Yeah. Would you say that this is a, a bridge between the digital innovations that we talked about earlier and the therapy that you do? It, does it, it work? Do you know? Um, it certainly is a link. And I know that there have been studies with the robot dog, Ibo, and the, there's a... a um, a seal called Paro that they use in, in nursing homes. And yes, actually it does have positive effects. Um, some studies have compared it to live animals. Um, I'm not sure, I, I hope the, the live animals won because I would say there's still another feedback that you get from a live animal, but the electronic animals are better than no animals because um, they, they have a very soft fur. They give you some reactions, you know, when you pet them the right way. And obviously some people are very, you know, it's like a stuffed animal when you had an attachment to a stuffed animal as a, as a child. And, and some people really get attached to this little uh, robot seal. Um, but I think um, the, the live animals really do have more advantages. I still would like to see some research petting the, the robot seal and if you get any oxytocin peaks. Mm. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll but see. You know, no, actually it would be good because, you know, it's a, no no animal protection problems with that. Mm. No animal welfare problems with that. And maybe no allergies and stuff like that either. So, no allergies, but, yeah. Uh, 